But today we're going to be talking about tea, what a transition that is. I've always really been curious about the healing power of tea. And today we know that botanicals used in tea can strengthen and tone immune function. They can prevent cancer, slow aging, maintain cardiovascular functions, and alleviate common psychological symptoms such as insomnia, anxiety, and even mild depression. So what are the healing properties? We're going to be talking about all of these today and how you can use it to better your health. I'm so excited that I invited <laughs> Megan to come talk to us today about the healing power of tea. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you all. And I am just, I love talking about this subject and the fact that so many people are interested in tea just lights my world up. <laughs> when I, oh, when know, I first it lights my world this. up too when I saw um, that Christina, your partner, um, in your business said that you were doing something on tea, I reached out right away. I'm like, let's do this. So let me tell you a little bit more about Megan. Megan is a certified holistic health counselor and herbalist with a master's in human nutrition. Megan has helped hundreds of people cultivate their psychological and spiritual nourishment through her work with functional medicine, botanical medicine, and lifestyle changes. Megan has studied herbal medicine, nutrition, somatic healing, and the ways that trauma impacts our ability to have a clear path to healing. So you've got such a diverse background, and um, I think I need to work with you on some nutrition stuff here pretty soon. So, But let's talk about tea. That's why we're here today. And there's really nothing better than... Um, than tea and just hanging out and drinking a cup of tea. What was the inspiration for your interest in tea, Megan? My interest in tea started, I would say probably 20 plus years ago when I first started studying herbal medicine. So I had a very, very dear friend fall ill to a very complex and rare autoimmune disease. This was a person that essentially raised me as a child. And um, she had an autoimmune condition called Wegener's granulomatosis. And she, when I, as we, as I was growing up, she was kind of my introduction to all things nature, all things natural world. And um, it hit a point where in her treatment, just no questions were being asked about food, no questions were being asked about what else she could potentially be doing. And she ultimately um, died when I was 19. And um, it was at that point where I just felt there had to be more to this. And I met my first herbal mentor, her name was Carol Trasado, and she really took me under her wing and I studied under her for many years. And, um, you know, she, as a studying, when we first started studying herbalism, she wouldn't let me go beyond tea for the first year because it, there's so much power within tea and there's so much we can learn about it. So that was really where my, um, where my relationship with tea. And when I say tea, I'm talking about herbal tea. I just want to clarify that. Like, yes, there are many forms of tea, but for the purpose of today, we're mainly going to be talking about um, herbal and medicinal tea. That's terrific. So you're a part of the Slow Medicine Collective with Christina Tidwell that I interviewed earlier this year. We had a delightful conversation. So we've heard of the slow food movement, the slow lifestyle movement, and even the slow flower movement. Tell us about the slow medicine movement. So when the Slow Medicine Collective kind of first came into my mind, I mean, I've been working with people for going on 15 years now, and there's just this desire, especially with even within herbal medicine and even within the functional nutrition and functional medicine circles for that magic pill, you know, in some ways, like functional medicine or functional nutrition, or even in like worlds of the naturopathy, it's like we've substituted the prescription for the supplement. And it just became very clear to me that I want to slow medicine down. And it's, it's a hard, it's, it's a, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes because if people are sick and not feeling well, they want to get better right away. But we have to enter our bodies. We have to get into our bodies 
in order to really heal our bodies and gain insight and ask ourselves the questions, what does my body need? And that takes time. And, you know, I'm for, you know, I'm an example where at 40, I'm in surgical menopause and it, for, I have 40 years of what brought me there. So to think that just taking a supplement or even taking herbs is going to fix the problem. It's going to, it's just, we have to slow things down. And I see the slow medicine collective as an emerging or slow medicine, I should say, as an emerging paradigm of where we get to help people heal that encourages um, a new process where it's intentional, it's supportive, it takes to, into account us as humans, like we are human beings who are trying to heal and we have to embrace the fact that we're human and not superhuman <laughs> right. all the time. And people are looking for that quick fix and it's become so much a part of our society that we pop a pill. I mean, you just watch you know, any newscast these days and who are advertising the most, it's this um, pharmaceutical companies. It's like, oh, take this and your problems will be over. Instead of looking at the core of who you are as a, like you said, a human being that, you know, everybody is, everybody and everybody is different. And you really have to look at the whole framework of who you are and your past experiences to know how to treat someone. Yeah, exactly. It's being inviting, inviting the human. I mean, one of my mentors reflected, she was like, you're good at being human. I was like, well, I think that's a good compliment. <laughs> and I think that's one of the ways that actually tea can really help us as it invites us to bring our humanness into, into, you know, the forefront, into the picture. Well, and it also makes us slow down because there's nothing better really than sitting down in, in a cozy chair with a blanket or just even sitting here talking to you with a cup of tea. It really does kind of center you in a way that another drink doesn't. So tell yes. us how tea impacts our well-being. So tea really can impact our well-being in that it invites all of our senses if we can and it allows us to bring a sense of mindfulness into our day um you know I feel like in in many different circles tea oftentimes gets overlooked it's like yes making a cup of tea is nourishing and it's delicious and it's cozy and it's um it's all the things right we sit by a fire with the book with a warm cup of tea especially during the winter time mm -hmm. um but we forget that tea actually has a lot of medicinal and powerful properties within it even if we're not necessarily working with um, herbal tea. I mean, even if we think about green tea, green tea has so many different um, healing properties, especially for women, you know, just in what it can do for estrogen metabolism and detox. Green tea is incredibly, incredibly powerful. But it's making tea is one way that we can really lean in to supporting our bodies and you know, humans have been adding plants. So like in its most basic form, what tea is, is plants added to water. <laughs> and that was, that was the original medicine. I mean, humans have been adding plants to water for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. And, um, you know, well, some, one thing. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Or this is one thing we like to do at the Slow Medicine Collective is we invite people to explore their lineage and like going far back, like where, you know, where are your um, people of origin from and what were the plants they were originally working with? And, you know, if that's not your thing and you don't know or you don't know your people of origin, like you can just know that somewhere in your lineage, somebody worked with plants and water to heal their bodies. And what did you find out about your lineage? I am all over the place. So my, I have um, German and my, um, I have um, Irish and my great, great grandma, I just found this out actually after my mom passed a couple of years ago, my great, great grandma, it was a Mayan in the Yucatan Peninsula, Curandera. So 
I'm really just learning more and more about my grandma Sophia, but um, that actually made sense. I was like, oh, that's where I get it. That's from. <laughs> that's why I asked you that because I I knew that, and um, I wanted you to mention that because I think that that connection with your grandma is so beautiful. Yeah. So one of the beautiful, an invitation that I think tea brings is to bring us to have that deeper connection with nature and its healing practices. And sometimes we forget that that nature heals. I mean. A lot of people do, I think. But um, tell us about making a medicinal cup of tea and how that enables this deep physiological um, tending that affects the cellular body. Yeah. So the ritual of drinking tea or even ritualizing tea is just a way that we can invite the very essence of our beings into a quiet and gentle conversation with what is happening in our bodies. So even if you think about making a cup of tea, you're inviting the five senses. You get the smell of the herbs as you're pouring the water over, you know, the, and when, when I say herbs, this is a question that came up in the, the last time I taught this. I'm, mainly I'm talking about dried herbs just because I think it's more easeful. And if you have the skills to go out and harvest your own, um, herbs, great. That's amazing. It works for fresh herbs too, but mainly I'm talking about dried herbs for the context of this call. Um, you know, the the way the warm tea feels going down your throat, the feeling of the jar or the cup in your hand, really turning into all these senses is such an accessible way to bring mindfulness to what's going on in your body and in your internal and external environment. So, and by external meaning, like what's happening in your immediate surrounding, what can you see, what can you hear? And your internal is how am I feeling? Like what's happening in my belly? Does it feel soft and relaxed? Are my shoulders up around my ear? Is my heart beating fast? Do I have any pain? Is my heart, you know, am I feeling excessively stressed? Like it's an invitation to check in with what is happening physiologically in, in your body. Um, so, and then I, go ahead. I was go just saying the mere act of caring for ourselves by making tea a practice is a simple way that we can show our bodies love and that like we're curious, like we want to know what's going on in there. <laughs> so as you're listening to your own body, how can we use tea every day to benefit our health? Let's talk about that. Because I think this is such an important point that it's not just when you have a chronic illness or an issue, but you can increase your health every day by choosing the right types of tea. So let's talk about yeah. that. So um, I'm going to just kind of list out a couple of things yep. that I find to be true. So tea is very affordable right? It's more affordable than a capsule. It's more affordable than a tincture more often than not. If you grow your own herbs, tea is essentially free, right? Like I have a big garden full of medicinal herbs that I will harvest fresh or, and then I dry them. Um, so tea is free. Um, tea has the added benefit of hydration, um, a lot of teas are a better choice than tinctures. And what it's doing is it's essentially, the way I like to think of it is it's bathing your cells at a cellular level. It's giving your, your cells, your mitochondria, a nutritious bath that is so nourishing and so full of um, nutrients and constituents that are giving your body the information, like number one, that you care. Number two, that, hey, we get to function. Like here's just some amazing nutrients that I am a lot like giving you an internal bath with. And the body responds. Like I really do believe that the body feels that, like we respond in a really positive way to, to that tea and to those herbal baths, internal herbal baths that I like to so, say. So is the herbal bath, I love that explanation. Is that why tea is better than a tincture? For some things, yes. So um, there, tea in general, it, water is just an excellent solvent, especially for minerals. Anything that's mucilage, which is one of my least favorite words. I have a really hard time saying it. So minerals, <laughs> mucilage, um, they're, um, 
it's better, you know, for certain, like the biggest ones being mineral and mineral rich herbs. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not going to talk about all of these today, but stinging nettle, like what I'm drinking right now, chickweed, which is a very common herb that grows all over the place, um, violet, but the mm. violets are trying to pop up here, but they just keep mm. getting covered in snow. <laughs> um, <laughs> red clover, alfalfa, dandelion leaf specifically, those are all really, really, really mineral rich herbs. So by steeping them in water, it just enables those mineral um, constituents mm. to really be a lot more bioavailable to the body. And hence you're like giving yourself a mineral bath if you're drinking. Well, I appreciate that because I didn't know. So thank you so much. <laughs> I yeah. If I was wondering, I figured somebody else was too. So let's talk about how we, when your health is compromised, how does tea help us heal? And how do you work with patients specifically on identifying which tea would be best? So tea, and I, I go, so in the essence of slow medicine and slow medicine collective, I go really slow. So it's really important to me that when we're working with tea on a specific health issue, we start with one herb at a time. Mm -hmm. A lot of practitioners like to add in, you know, blends. And while, yes, that's completely fine, I actually really believe in the power of building a relationship with that which you are working with and the plants that you are working with. So for someone who is coming in, <clears throat> who is, you know, feeling very deficient, say their energy is really lacking. Um, I do a lot with, you know, looking at blood work. If I'm seeing in their blood work that they're deficient in other ways, um, you know, anemia is very common. So if someone's coming in with anemia, I'm going to have them start working with, we'll say nettle. I mean, it's so bio-individual. So mm -hmm. um, each person's gonna have a different um, recommendation, of course, but I will have them do a long steep of nettle. So this is one of the, well, I think we'll get into this in a little bit of the different ways to make tea, but nettle when extracted over a longer period of time. So by long period, I mean like three to eight hours of adding oh, the, wow. yeah, adding the herbs to, I always use mason jars, adding the herbs to the mason jar, pouring the water over, letting it steep, usually overnight, like what I'm drinking right now is steeping, it's been steeping overnight. Um, and then gently reheating it. I don't want to bring it to a boil the next day, but just bring it to, bring it to gently reheating it and then drinking it. That is one way that I would integrate that herb into that person's care. And I, like I said, I like to start with one herb at a time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that down the road, I won't add more to their tea blend, but if there's one thing that everyone walks away with today, I would love it to be, to really slow down and start with one thing and build a relationship and build a trust with it. I mean, mm -hmm. I know for How me, long does it normally take, or is that individual to the person? I think it's individual to the person. It's, it's, um, you know, I like to encourage people to do some research. Like I will give them a handout, you know, say, or a little bit of a monograph in, in herbal medicine, we call them herbal monographs. I, I might give them a, a um, a shortened monograph. Cause you also don't want to overwhelm them with too much information, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, inviting the senses. What are you smelling today? If that, if you want to start with that, what are you really tasting or even doing different steep times? Can you tell the difference if you steep it for three hours versus if you steep it for eight hours, like really being in that, bringing in that, um, what I like to call um, intentional and compassionate curiosity for what we're most wanting to know and what's going to help us feel brave with working with these herbs. I mean, I've been given tons upon tons of supplements and yes, I know what they're doing because it's my job to know what they're doing. But mm -hmm. the amount of people I've worked with that come in who are taking, you know, 10 to 15 different supplements and herbs, and they have no idea what they're doing for their body. And, you know, it's not to say that that's bad, but it's certainly going to be more impactful if they have an understanding mm -hmm. of what each um, herb or supplement is doing for them. 
Well, that's just a reminder to slow down a little bit and understand exactly. what you are putting in your body. I was just, um, someone mentioned the other day that we were talking to online that, um, that um, pills, you know, like nutrition pills like this, um, are the least, uh, least certified or the least regulated of anything. And so it is really important to know what you are putting in your body, you know, whether it's a tea or a supplement. Um, so anyway, we're yeah. going to switch gears. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about um, how would you suggest people start working with tea? Uh, you know, you talked about the steeping time frames, but let's talk about how, I mean, even if you go to the grocery store, say we don't go to you and a yep. medical professional and we yes. go to the grocery store and there's this bevy of right. options that you see in front of you, where do you start? So I typically start, I have certain tea brands that I really like. Um, so if you're at the grocery store and yeah, there are so many options. I mean, I can remember like whether it's tea or even Kleenex. I don't know if anyone tried to buy Kleenex lately. There's like 87 different brands. It's <laughs> insane. Um, what I, the brands that I like, I really love traditional medicinals. That's mm -hmm. one really good one you can get at the grocery store. I saw someone in the chat is drinking the uh, Puka, P-U-K-K-A. I love that brand. They are wonderful. And they have more mixes, but they're, um, I don't know that there are too many where it's like one herb necessarily, um, but their mixes are lovely. I love yogi tea. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I just need, honestly, like as much as I need the yogi tea, I need the little thing, the little message that it gives Yeah, me. I know. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> I know. Like, oh, what's my message for today? <laughs> it's like the best, it's like for, for the best way to get fortunes or fortune cookies. Um, those are the, and then I also really love Rishi, R-I-S-H-I. Um, tea um that's a that you can't necessarily get at the store that's something that you would um get online i know at natural grocers they at least down here in portland or oregon they um they um sometimes carry them but and then if you want to start working with individual herbs and you just want to go slow in that way mountain rose herbs um so if you if someone can google mountain rose herbs and maybe put that in the chat that's a really great place to buy loose leaf herbs just by themselves and then you can kind of pick and choose you know and even we're going to go through some herbs to start to play with today um you can pick and choose some of the herbs and they sell them in different quantities um i will give one caveat with them is they take a really really long time to ship so i just so that expectation Good is <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, yes they, you know, they're great. They have wonderful herbs and sometimes it can take a very long time for them, for their herbs to ship out. And most, you know, honestly, my favorite place in the world is to seek out my local apothecaries. So here in Portland, I know there's a ton of them in Seattle, um, mm -hmm. even just Googling mm -hmm. apothecary near me. And that is a place where you can actually go in and experience the herbs in a, and actually like open the jar and smell the herbs that when I was first learning about tea Carol my um my teacher she would she worked at an herb store and my job was to just go through and smell tea and I had a little like coffee like I had to smell the coffee after each oh, but it was really powerful it, yeah exactly smell. yeah and it was but it was really interesting to that was a way for me to see what my body was drawn to. I was very drawn to nettle and alfalfa at that time, whereas the sweeter like chamomile or even rose, those those ones were too, uh, the smell just wasn't doing it for my body. So mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful way to do it too. So I love um, encouraging people to do that. Um, with tea and really starting to work with it, asking yourself like taking just a moment and asking yourself where does it fit for me personally my herbal tea time is generally in the afternoon just before i pick up my kids i'm 10 i i'm, I'm drinking herbal tea this morning because i was really nervous and i didn't think green tea would really help my nerves <laughs> <laughs> but i really love drinking a long steeped cup of herbal tea 
just before I go pick up my kids because my energy tends to drop. I've had a full day of teaching or working with clients or working with those that I mentor. And I just tend to be exhausted and I don't want to show up for my kids exhausted. I want to show up for them rejuvenated. So, so that's... Go ahead. So Megan, which tea do you drink? At, usually um, at that time, I have a blend. So I'm past the doing just one at a time. Uh-huh. I have a blend that I make of um, nettle alfalfa, um, skull cap, a little bit of lemon balm and, um, a little bit of licorice. So I call that my nutritive nervine blend. So it's, it's not only nurturing and very nutritive to my system, but it's also just helping to kind of calm my mind and get me into a place where I'm ready to, um, be fully present with my two very energetic and beautiful little boys. <laughs> oh, that's so perfect. I love that. Um, so let's talk about herbs that we can play with. And we've talked about some mm-hmm. of these already, but specifically, let's talk about mint first. Okay. So first, one other thing I would love for you guys to leave with is you can feel brave with tea. So I think a lot of people, especially Great within point. herbal tea, like they're like, oh, I'm going to do it wrong. Or, oh, I I might mess myself up or I'm not going to, it's not going to be the right temperature. It's not going to be the long, right steep or the right. I just like, I really want everyone to leave feeling like you can be brave with tea. Like you're not going to mess it up. If you make a gross cup of tea, that's okay. Give it to the compost, oh, away. <laughs> to a plant. Like it's not a big, it's really, really not a big deal. Like we can be brave with tea. Um, okay. So mint. So mint as I'm assuming is an herb that everybody knows. If somebody doesn't know what mint is, um, raise your hand, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure most people know that it's very know easy it. to grow. So it can be free, yep. but make sure and contain it because it does it travel. Sure. <laughs> so it does it travel? It, it, does it, does travel. And it travels like distances i don't even distances, understand how it yeah. <laughs> but do you so do mint, your neighbors a favor and put it in a pot <laughs> exactly so mint is great for overall digestive system um it can help ease indigestion it can help ease gas and heartburn if you have ulcers it's great um it's anti-spasmatic So that means that it's great for menstrual cramps or even nausea. So anytime anyone in my house starts to feel a little bit of nausea, they both know that everybody knows that mama, can you just make us a quick cup of mint tea? Um, It's a mint is a vasodilator. So that means that it's stimulating circulation. So um, this is a really great herb to work with. If you feel like you need a bit of a pick me up. It helps clear a tired mind. Um, so that's another one I will reach for if I'm especially tired or if I'm not sleeping well. Um, I don't know about anybody else in menopause, but sleep is a little tricky to come by sometimes. Um, so mint can really help just like get everything flowing and stimulate your body so that you feel like it's like a natural pick me up. I love that. It's one of my favorites. It's a and, really good one to start with. And actually I had no idea that it had all of those benefits and I'm going to start drinking more. <laughs> I, well, I might yeah. be drinking more of all of these pretty soon. So let's, <laughs> so you're drinking nettle right now um, because you were a little nervous. So is that a calm, calmer, calming herb or how would you it's, describe that? Nettle is actually more mineral rich um, and chlorophyll rich. It brings strength and support to the whole body. I just, I have a, um, I have a relationship with nettle and it's the first herb I ever worked with. So it helps me just feel more like grounded in myself, especially, um, I'm a very introverted person. So doing, um, talks is like, you know, I love it and it's so much fun and I'm used to it, but it also makes, I get nervous. So I try, I I go for my ally that's going to help ground me, (laughs) but nettle is, I mean, when it comes to the world of herbal medicine, it really, to me, she is the like queen of the queen. So she is incredibly mineral rich, chlorophyll rich. Um, nettle can bring strength and support to the whole body. It acts as a blood purifier. Um, it's a wonderful antihistamine. So a lot of us, especially more recently, I feel like a lot of us are dealing with more histamine allergy type issues. And I'm not sure, I haven't 
figured out what's going on there, but there's something happening where people, I know so many people who are having a lot of histamine issues. And so nettle can come in and support that. It's deeply nutritive. And what I mean by nutritive is that it nourishes and brings nutrients to the whole body, all the way down to our cells and our mitochondria. So when I was talking about earlier in giving yourself your in your um, body an internal mineral breath, nettle is mm -hmm. a perfect one to work with. Um, it's really high in calcium, it's high in magnesium, it's high in iron and vitamins A, D, C, zinc, and potassium. So you really can't go wrong with nettle. And, you know, if you live in a place like nettles are actually sold at farmer's markets now, like I, I'm lucky that I just have to walk into my woods and I can gather a ton of nettles. But now they're starting to be sold at grocery stores. Um, I know here in Portland, they're sold at the farmer's market. And then of course you can get dried nettles also. They're, they're everywhere. And Christina and I actually are gonna do a talk later in March all on two spring herbs. So trying to keep it narrow and deep and we'll be talking about nettle during that um, oh, free talk great. also. Yeah. And we'll be, we'll be telling you how to get in touch with um, the Slow Medicine Collective at the end. So with the nettles, for instance, how long did you let that steep? So the nettles are the ones that I do, and you'll see on the chart once we get, once we get there, oh. a longer steep. So okay. um, I do about, this has a smoothie in it, but I do a bigger mason jar, and I'll probably put about half a cup to a cup of nettle in there and then pour hot water, boiling water, no, I, I do near boiling um, over it. And then I let it steep for um, at least like overnight, six to eight hours. Uh, okay. I love a very, very long steep. Okay, and we are, we will be talking about the, um, the steeping in a few minutes. So dandelion and then hibiscus. So dandelion root, and we're talking about the root here is amazing for digestive and liver support. Um, it's super rich in inulin, so it's also a great prebiotic. It has bitter properties, so sipping dandelion tea before a meal is one way to really prep your digestive system. So in thinking about where tea fits, if you are someone that struggles with digestive function or you feel... Um, you know, any, if you feel any queasiness afterwards, or just in general, if you're checking in, you know, your digestive system starts in your mind and goes all the way down to your colon. And if there's a place in your system that feels like it needs support, sipping dandelion tea just before you eat is a really great way to prep and prime your, your digestive system. Um, especially if buying like a tincture or like a bitters formula isn't, you know, feasible or available to you. Um, hibiscus is a wonderful natural liver and kidney tonic. Um, some people love it as a weight loss herb. Um, it's revered for its beneficial effects for the heart. So even if you think about the color of hibiscus, it's very, very red and red anything really mm -hmm. loves the heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it can help to lower cholesterol levels and specifically your LDL. Um, it helps with reducing blood pressure. It's incredibly high in those anti, um, anti-cyanins um, or antioxidants. Um, you know, it's hibiscus recently has been the focus of a lot of studies for its anti-inflammatory, cardioprotective, neuroprotective, and hepatoprotective qualities. So hepatoprotective, if you don't know what any of those are, neuroprotective is your mind, okay. hepatoprotective is your liver, cardio, your heart. Um, I think we all know what anti-inflammatory is. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great tonic tea for people who are struggling with heart disease and high cholesterol. And it's in general, it's very preventative against free radical stress in the body. And hibiscus is delicious. So you know, for my dad, my father has many of these issues. He's got high blood pressure and he has zero interest in anything I have to say and offer just like nutrition, like zero, <laughs> like I play no part in his medical team. That's so but funny I, to me. I have like, been able up. to get him 
I know I have been able to get him to drink hibiscus tea because it's so beautiful. And he's actually made a practice of drinking the hibiscus tea and he's, whether he's seen the benefits or not, I've seen the benefits in his labs, but um, it's a, you know, it, it, it's a really good one for those people in our lives who may not necessarily be interested in working with herbs or anything on more on the natural side it's a great one to just be like here just drink hibiscus tea it won't do anything it won't even be anything <laughs> positive or negative but it just tastes good i'm gonna go get some of that so i have a question on labs because i think this is a really important point particularly working with someone like you how often do you suggest getting labs so that you can see the changes in somebody's lab work? If I'm working with somebody, I like to see their labs every three months. So, three and months, it okay. will, yeah, it will depend. I mean, uh, some folks I work with, I need, I, I want to see a lot more elaborative abs, but especially if we're working on something in particular, I want to be able mm -hmm. to know if the interventions we're working with are actually working. And that's also important for. I think the patient or the client, because mm -hmm. that also helps them not only build trust with what they're working with, but trust with that their bodies can heal. Like we have to remember, so many of us have forgotten that like our bodies are so primed and ready to heal. We're, we're taught that like we have to seek outward, seek outward, seek outward, but our bodies inward. are so much stronger inward. than inward. anyone <laughs> has ever told us, you know, exactly. I mean, I grew up with boomer parents and my boomer parents were like, no, you take the antibiotics. Don't trust your body. <laughs> so yeah, yes, let's get months. back to, um, I think if, if anything that I would like to do in my life is to get people to look at options, like natural options to heal their bodies. But that's, that's a side note for me. Um, <laughs> marshmallow root. So marshmallow root is a wonderful, wonderful, and I think I saw in the chat someone pop in um, about a mucil or supporting the gut lining. So marshmallow root is a mucilaginous herb. And the way that I like to think about marshmallow root is, and you steep it and we will brew it in an actually much different way than most people think. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but marshmallow it is essentially coating. So your throat all the way down to your colon, it's mm -hmm. giving this protective layer. You know, if we even think about a um, an upset stomach or an acidic stomach or, you know, an stomach cramps that happen after we eat, whether it's the lower bowel or the large, intest the large intestine, um, it's, it's basically providing a coating all not coding a coating <laughs> all the way through <laughs> that mm -hmm. is helping to just soothe out the tissues that are within the body that's great so i think that this is a perfect um question for right now before we get into the chart of steeping but what words do you have for switching from coffee to tea oh it's hard it it's is hard, hard don't expect I have, it to look be at, easy look at this i have a little bit of um, this and a little bit of that i think so asking yourself first like do you really feel like you need to make that switch i mean there's a lot of there are benefits to coffee i cannot drink coffee i have i have anxiety like it's it's a real thing for me and if i drink coffee i literally will feel my nervous system just like mm -hmm. Um, but if you don't have to give up the coffee, like I just, I always like to encourage that question. Um, and if it's something you really, really love and enjoy and your body likes the coffee, then, you know, explore whether someone on the internet told you, you need to stop drinking coffee or you really need to, or you yourself feel like you do. So that's question number one. Um, if you do really feel like you need to come off the coffee, um, starting really slow. So if you, you know, taking a regular cup of coffee and doing half calf, half decaf, and then doing that for a few days, and then doing um, three quarters decaf to a quarter calf, and then doing that for a few days, and then going all the way to decaf. And then, you know, just expecting that you might get a headache, you might go through some detox, and how are you going to nourish your body through that? It might be hard. I don't always recommend, like I typically recommend people stop drinking or trying to make these transitions closer to the weekend. So that, you know, if you start on a Wednesday or Thursday, by Monday, 
you're at least like kind of through the headachey parts of it. Um, and then, you know, what do you love about the coffee? And then, um, yes, I do still feel nervous with decaf. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Uh, I wish, I wish I didn't. Um, the um, and asking yourself, do you like to have a creamy? Like, do you like to add a little bit of cream to your coffee? Like, what do you love about your coffee ritual? And then from there, substituting. So for me, I used to just drink black coffee. So it, I didn't necessarily need to do like a yummy creamy cup I was able to just get to my my green tea um and even matcha is too much for me so I can really only drink just like basic green tea um if you do like that creamy there's um there's a brand called dandy blend that is really really delicious and it's mainly just dandy like dandelion roots ground up and you can you know you add that to a cup and you pour water over it and you can add whatever creamer or collagen or whatever deliciousness you're adding to it that's and that can really um uh what's the word I'm looking for that can really um engage that part of you that is just wanting that good cup of coffee because it's very ritual based for a lot of yes. people so I think we have to honor the ritual of what it is and then from there from that place of honoring the ritual figure out what's our path forward I think that's such an important point because my ritual with coffee started when I was five and with my great uncle and he, he and I were always the early birds and he, we would get up and have a cup of coffee. I mean, I would just dunk some toast in my coffee, but at five. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, but it's, well, it's longstanding. It's longstanding. So let's get to the chart because I think people are going to be really interested in seeing how you have um, broken this out. Hannah, can you bring that up? Okay, so let's right. talk about this chart. Okay, so these are the different ways of making tea. So a short infusion is what most people are familiar with. So this can be with green tea, this can be with black tea. Um, this is typically like we, you know, we put the, the water over the plant material <laughs> and steep it. And most people steep it for, you know, between five, 10 minutes or so. Um, and that's great. There's, you're still getting, um, you're still getting, yes, Brenda, there will be a, a guide and a handout. Um, you're still getting the benefits um, to those herbs. Now, there are some herbs that are better for short infusions. So chamomile, is one that's that's actually better for a short infusion because of the volatile oils in it. it. It can get really, really strong, really, really fast. Peppermint is also one that is great for a shorter infusion and lavender. So when I'm talking, when I, when I say short infusion, um, what I mean by this is you're bringing, you know, you're bringing the water to a boil. You're adding one heaping teaspoon of herbs. Ideally, this is another practice I like to do. This isn't required. This doesn't like make that much of a difference, but I like to crush the herbs in my hand because that actually gets the senses going. It just becomes a little bit more of a practice as and an intention as I'm making the tea. Um, or you can do it with a mortar and pestle. So it's one teaspoon of herb per cup of water into your vessel. You pour the hot water over the herbs. You cover and you allow it to steep for your preferred time, depending on the herb. So the preferred time for chamomile, peppermint, and lavender is about five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So a long infusion is the same exact process, except for you're gonna let it steep for three to eight hours. And those are gonna be really good for those new, like deeply nutritive herbs. The ones I put here, cause you know, and there's a bazillion different herbs that we could work with, but it would take a very long time to <laughs> go through every single one of them. Well, that would be fun. I have to say Megan, but maybe another time. <laughs> exactly. Um, but for today we're talking about um, nettle, like I, we talked about earlier, catnip is another one that's really great. So catnip is in the mint family. That one actually is, so I say that because it grows like mint per your, you know, grow it in a pot. Um, and then red raspberry leaf is another one that's really great for a longer infusion. Um, solar infusions. So this is one of my favorite 
things to do with my kids. And this is how I introduced my children to herbs. And now they do this just on their own is you take a teaspoon of herbs, again, ideally crushed in your hands, and this can be fresh herbs from the garden, or this can be dried herbs. Um, and you add the herbs to the jar, cold water though, you're using cool water, and you just put a lid on it and you place it in a sunny spot for one to eight hours. And the sun is doing the job of gently extracting the properties and the constituents out of the plant. So lemon balm, mints are a great one for solar infusion. Um, lemon balm is another one that spreads everywhere. Just FYI, don't plant it if you're not ready <laughs> to tend to it. Um, and hibiscus. So that's how my dad, what I was talking about earlier, that's one of the ways he makes um, hibiscus. And I think um, Christina's dad also does sun and solar tea as well, which I thought is really cute. Um, and then the last infusion is a cold infusion. So this is where we take a heaping teaspoon of dried herbs, and then you add the you add cool water to the vessel of choice. Um, again, I always use like a quart size mason jar, and you allow it to steep overnight. You strain the the herbs, and then you heat it, um, heat it back up in the morning. So that's where marshmallow root. So because of the mucilaginous properties within marshmallow root, especially if we're wanting to work with it for digestive um, purposes, you really want to extract those constituents via cold water because it's not going to, you're not going to get the benefits if you do it in a, if you do it with hot. Um, so if you're dealing, if anyone's dealing with digestive discomfort, marshmallow root is a wonderful ally to bring in. You just want to do it with a cold infusion. And then decoctions are best for your roots, your barks, and any seeds that are considered, anything that's considered woody on the plant. So the woody part of the plant requires more energy to extract the plant constituents. And how to make a decoction is you bring cold water to a boil, you add one ounce of herb per quart of water. And once the herbs have been added, you kick the heat down or reduce the heat and you cover it for 20 minutes or so. You keep the cover on because you want and you want to keep the heat as low as possible. And then you turn the burner off. You put a strainer in your, um, you know, in your cup, pour the tea over it. And now you have a decoction. So anything that's woody, any roots for the most part, those you want to be bring into a decoction. And then people always have a question, well, what if I want to do, you know, a, a dandelion root nettle cup of tea. <laughs> so you have your hybrid, um, which is a brew of the combination of, you know, herbs that are better for decoctions and herbs that are better for infusions. And simply all you do is you um, brew the herbs that need to be decocted. You simmer them for 20 minutes, remove it for heat from the heat, and then you just add the additional herbs that you want to infuse. And you can allow them to steep for 10 minutes, or if you want to do that longer, if you're wanting to do nettle or do a longer steep, you can allow that um, the herbs to steep for up to eight hours. And then again, you can just bring that back up to a gentle heat. You don't want to boil. Like that's a big one. You don't want to boil because you'll boil off all of the medicinal constituents. Mm -hmm. Wow, I just learned so much. <laughs> um, so somebody asked about whether um, on the hibiscus, if you use the leaves or the petals or both? Both, all of the both. above, but mainly the petal, main, mainly the flowers. Okay, next question. Terrence, you've got some great questions today. Does putting lemon in some teas negatively affect its benefits? No, 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 no. I think it enhances, especially if you want a little bit more of a citrus, you get then you're getting the, the mm -hmm. properties of the lemon, which is helping to alkalize your system. Um, you know, it, this can be a, a funny conversation because we actually want to acidify our stomachs more, right? So we want our stomachs to be as acid -y as possible. We don't want, what happens with reflux is our esophageal flap, which is essentially somewhere in this region, gets loose. And why that's loose is because our stomach isn't acidic enough. 
So when we, you know, there's a lot of debate out there, but in, it's my belief that when we start taking something like a proton pump inhibitor, we're reducing the acid, but we're, that's just a band-aid. We're not actually, what we need is our stomach to be even more acidic. So that flap stays really, really firm and doesn't start to open up. So lemon really helps with that stomach acidity to keep us nice and firm and acidic, but it alkalizes the rest of the body. <laughs> so speaking of lemon water, do you recommend lemon water, warm lemon water in the morning to most of your clients? I love warm lemon water in the morning. Yes. Unless, you know, there are some people who have a, a bit of an aversion to it. Some people feel like it hurts their teeth. Um, it's just, you know, very bio-individual, but in general, um, drinking warm lemon water first thing in the morning, I like to think of it as like a a primer for the digestive system. We're really just like getting it going, inviting it into, um, in, you know, inviting the system into the day. Like, let's do this. Let's digest. I mean, digestion is the hardest job our bodies do all day long. So anything that we can do to help make that job a little bit easier allows our, all of our other functions to, you know, at least have some of the energy. So we have talked about so many different things today, Megan. <laughs> is there anything that we missed? Oh my goodness. Is there I'm sure there's, a, I mean, as we discussed, we could do a whole, you know, four hour workshop or eight hour workshop on teas. But <laughs> for today in our, you know, short 60 minutes together, is there any, yeah. are there any parting words about teas I that you'd like to impart? I think just uh, if you guys can, if everyone can just allow your body's intuition and your unique needs to guide you, you're allowed to do that. Like I said, my hope is that you can leave feeling brave with tea. Instead of asking, am I going to do this right? Asking, what does my body feel like it needs today? I'm feeling extra cold. I'm feeling a little depleted. I didn't sleep very well. Um, it's rainy out, it's snowing, you know, like what is happening around you and allowing that to guide you? Um, you know, what's happening with the weather? Is it a good day for a solar brew? I mean, today it's like cloudy, so clearly not a good day for a solar brew. Um, are you feeling the need for some deeper nourishment? Like, gift your senses with a cup of tea that you know you can feel brave with and allow your needs the needs of your body to guide you. Like you really, really can't go wrong with tea. Like you can't do it wrong. It's, you know, there's a, um, <laughs> and listen <yeah>. to your body. <laughs> yes. right. So tell us about some of the upcoming offerings from the slow medicine collective and you and Christina. So we, we have, um, we're going to be um, doing monthly workshops where, you know, we gather for 60 minutes or 90 minutes, kind of like this. And um, this one that's coming up in March, we're going to talk about two herbs, just, just two, only two, two spring herbs that we can start um, working with, not just from a medicinal place, but also from a food base. I really want to bring, because we can work with um, herbs with food as well. Um, and it's a really powerful way to get those nutrients in. Um, we do have an eight week program where it's a, um, it's a group program called Awaken. And that is all about just inviting, awakening your body, like bringing your body into a place where it's ready to step into healing and ready to be in a relationship with healing. So that I believe we're going to be launching sometime in, in April or May, um, what else do we have? Um, we have oh, somebody else, are, which two spring herbs are you going to be doing the deep dive with? We're going to be doing a deep dive um, with nettle for sure. And I'm having a really hard time in deciding if I want to do cleavers or if I want to do chickweed. So, or if I want to <laughs> do dandelion leaves, it's hard. Like it's really hard to narrow. I can't imagine how them. there's so many to choose from. I think it'll probably be dandelion leaves and nettle because those are two, not only can they be extremely medicinal, but they, um, you can really work with them in food in so many different ways. So That's probably terrific. those two. Well, Megan, then, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I think Did those are the two main ways for, uh, oh, and we also, uh, Christina and I are also both taking um, some, we have some spots available for one-on-one. -on -one. So um, you can go to our one-on-one -on -one page and learn more about our work. There, you know, and we see our 
our work is very much a partnership with our clients. So wonderful. Well, Megan, um, thank you so much. I've learned so much about tea today, and I feel my like pleasure. my world has been expanded in ways that I didn't know that oh, existed good. out there. So thank you. And thank you, Christina, as well. It was a joy talking with you earlier this year. Um, have a great day. Thank you.